I broke my spine when I was 21 years old. You know, I used to be a springboard and platform diver. I would stand 10 meters in the sky, and I would jump willingly, and I would do multiple flips and twists all within three seconds before landing into the water head first, trying to make as little splash as possible. Now, it wasn't one dive that broke my spine. It was a stress fracture that led to chronic stress due to the fact that I had a slipping of my disc and ultimately led to the full breaking. One doctor told me that I needed to have surgery, and another doctor told me, prolong surgery, and instead, let's try yoga. Both, however, agreed that my diving career was over. And as distraught as I was, I took a leap of faith, and I tried yoga. And as cliche as this might sound, it changed my life. Yoga not only helped bring me on the path of health and healing of my body, but it also introduced me to meditation, and it gave me this newfound sense of spirit in life. And I've sustained my yoga practice now for two decades because that same sense of spirit has translated into other areas of my life, specifically the way I run my business. Now, business and spirituality don't tend to have a lot of overlapping concepts together. Spirituality can be very personal. It's sacred and perhaps even abstract. Whereas business is much more practical. It's every day and maybe even at times cutthroat. However, there's an increasing number of businesses that are adopting spiritual practices like yoga and meditation to help intervene with clients, to help intervene with employees, to help their businesses be better. They do this by helping to prevent burnout. They do this to help prevent turnover and as well as absenteeism. They also are adding yoga and meditation because it's shown to produce higher productivity, greater creativity, as well as higher innovation. So with impressive results like this, I asked the question, what else can business learn from spirituality? Now, spirituality might have a lot of different definitions to it. You know, there are practices that are very focused on, you know, faith-based. But when I think of the word spirituality, I'm talking about the Latin root spiritual, which is spear, which means to breathe. The other Latin word that's very, very consistent with this is called spiritus, which means to be filled with life or to be infused with breath. How can we breathe life into employees? How can we breathe life into organizations? How can we breathe life into all stakeholders so that it serves society? And when I say stakeholders, I'm looking at not only just employees and employers, but customers, perhaps the families of employees and employers, as well as the surrounding communities, whether they're local communities or perhaps they're global communities. One of the most important questions that we need to ask ourselves are what are the practices that businesses can apply that are life-giving, and what are the practices that they're offering currently that they can stop because they're life-depleting? Now, in a recent American Psychological Association study, it said that one-fourth of Americans say that stress is number one because of work. In another study, which is even more staggering, 80% were said to say that they were dissatisfied with their jobs. Now, we combine this with the fact that we spend over one-third of our lives at work. It's no wonder that many call chronic stress the great health epidemic of the 21st century. Now, stress doesn't just affect individuals. Stress also greatly affects organizations. In David Gellis's book, Mindful Work, he talks about how chronic stress can increase the cost of healthcare by roughly $2,000 annually per employee. In another study with healthcare giant Aetna, when they partnered with Duke Medical School, they found out that not only can stress diminish when you add yoga and meditation into programs, but you can actually increase productivity by roughly $3,000 annually per employee. So we're looking at like a potential $5,000 different swing by simply adding a very low cost intervention like yoga or meditation. Now, yoga has grown immensely in popularity over the past decade. It's now estimated that there are 300 million people that are practicing yoga worldwide. Furthermore, that is three times the number that we're practicing literally just a decade ago, which is astounding growth. 56% of those people that are practicing say that they're practicing because they need to improve their quality of life due to chronic stress. Now, when we think of yoga, a lot of us think of the physical form of yoga, 
it's an exercise, it's a movement. And there's a lot of truth to that because it's one of the eight branches of yoga. But yoga is actually a total body, mind, and spiritual tool for breathing life into living systems. I am an example of the results. Now, when we think of this, we have to start to again ask ourselves, how can we use yoga as a framework to help us? Maybe yoga isn't necessarily the proper intervention at every single organization, but the framework might give us insight into how we can utilize it. So when I was in graduate school, I was studying positive psychology. And in positive psychology, we look at three main areas. We look at how can we breathe life into individuals, into families, as well as into organizations. And for organizations, we call this positive organizational scholarship. And there's a lot of research around positive organizations. In fact, there's one particular that's quoted most intensely because of its effectiveness, that Jane Dutton, Marianne Glenn, and Gretchen Spreitzer have developed three criteria that help to establish whether an organization is deviating towards the positive. The first is that they have a concern with flourishing. The second is that there is an emphasis on the life-giving practices. And the third is that they have a focus on developing character strengths. The Peter Drucker quote that if you can align your strengths so strongly, your weaknesses become irrelevant, is relevant to how we can help organizations, individuals, deviate positively. Now, just like a vibrant human is made of cells that are full of life, a vibrant organization is going to be made of employees that are full of life. So when I think of flourishing, life-giving practices, as well as developing character strengths, I think of these as the body, the mind, and the spirit of the organization and how we can fuel life into those three domains. If we can educate employees on the positive interventions of how to flourish, if we can start to educate on the resiliency and why is character strength really important, and if we can start practicing through the spirit and the culture of the organization to apply life-giving principles, then we can redefine the future of business. Now, what I'm about to say is that basically I'm in a lot of student debt because my first graduate degree was in business. I was earning my MBA. And it was in the years 2007 through 2009, which is now known as essentially the Great Recession. And one of our professors could sense that we were very worried about the job market. And so he told us, don't accept a job just because it's available. Do something that will define your role in this world. That word defined stood out to me so strongly that all my fears and all my self-egos and limitations that I had put on myself were put to the side momentarily. And I said, you know what? I want to share how can I bring life through the practice of yoga to others so I can share how beneficial it's been to me. One year later, after that professor's statement, I opened up my first studio. And now a decade later, we have roughly 20 locations from Texas to Dubai. Now, the only reason I mention that is because I'm intimately familiar with what the strengths are with business. Businesses want to be better. Businesses want to perform. And this is the strength that gives business a positive advantage for how they can positively change our society. If businesses are concerned with flourishing, if businesses are concerned with developing character strengths, and if businesses want to apply life-giving practices, then we have to ask the question, what and how can we do this better? Psychologist William James refers to this notion of better as meliorism. Similar to the Spanish word mejor, meaning better, it's asking us the question of how can we do things better? It states that there's no good or bad. However, it implies that we can make things better through our actions. I want you to think of it like this. There's two ends of the spectrum, constructive meliorism and mitigative meliorism. Constructive meliorism says, what can we construct? What can we add to make things better? If I were to give you a, a garden as an example, the garden, you'd say, okay, well, what can we add to make this garden flourish? What can we add to make this garden better? And we would say, well, we might need to add more water, or we might need to add more soil or sunlight. And on the opposite side, this mitigative meliorism says, okay, well, what do we need to mitigate? What do we need less of to help this garden flourish? And in this example, maybe it's the weeds that are there. Maybe it's the pests. The end result happens to be called balanced meliorism. 
And balanced meliorism is the key to helping us to grow the good and get rid of the things that we don't need that are preventing us from flourishing. Again, flourishing, character strengths, life-giving practices. What can we grow and what do we need to get rid of to accomplish this? Now, Barbara Fredrickson, who did a lot of research in positive psychology, calls the result of balanced meliorism a broaden and building effect. When we are broadened, we breathe in the goodness, we breathe in positive emotion, we have more of a vantage. And we build resources, and we build community, and we build connection. Employees are craving this sense of community and connection. It is noticeably declining in local communities and social groups, as well as people's connections to church and their families. Researchers show that those are on the decline. However, research also shows that when life-giving practices are implemented into organizations, they not only build a sense of attachment, but they build a sense of connection as well as belonging. Now, these might sound like soft skills of a business, but Raj Sisodia, Jag Sheth, and David Wolf showed that when companies are stakeholder-focused and they utilize a cooperative approach towards engaging community, these companies had eight times the return compared to the S&P 500 over a 10-year period. When you looked even closer at the years 2007 through 2009, these companies had a 14 to 1 advantage over the S&P 500. These seemingly virtuous and soft skills have hard, factual, resilient numbers to back them up. Now, we do live in a time when anxiety, when stress is rising, it's trending upwards somewhat consistently. Yoga is a powerful framework for breathing life into living systems. Positive psychology, they have scientifically studied evidence-based practices that can be intervened to help organizations to thrive. I ask every business leader, every community leader, every school leader, every family leader, what can you do to create vibrant health? What can you do to create engaging work or high quality connections? Perhaps it's a sense of purpose or meaning in your area of domain. The fact is, the future of success will ask us to not only ask this question, but to answer and to take action on what can we grow and what do we need to eliminate. Businesses are standing at the top of a really powerful platform capable of making extreme positive changes. I want them to jump and dive into this pool of well-being. And this time, let's make a huge splash. Thank you. Yeah.